Hello and welcome to Produced By. Just quickly before we begin, if you enjoy the show, please consider supporting it by joining our Patreon. You can choose from a list of memberships and will receive some exciting rewards. Thank you and back to the episode. Hello Charlie, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Thomas. I'm looking forward to being here. So, Charlie, can you please introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Charlie Hills. You might have seen me on LinkedIn, maybe, but I'm a marketer with a bit of a passion for AI and content creation. Yep. So, always like to start uh, with a bit of your background. So, can you tell us where do you come from? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I'm from uh, rainy UK, uh, Brighton's <laughs> specifically the seaside, but oh, well. now I reside in London. But, I mean, uh, rainy UK, but Brighton, it's one of the most beautiful or, you know, beach place. So it's actually a nice place, isn't it? I mean, I guess you take for granted what you have, but it, it's the fact it's like a pebbly beach. I just don't like it. Like if we had sand, it'd be. You know, oh, yeah, that is true. <laughs> but still, given it's in the UK, it's it's great, isn't it? Uh, yeah, 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 no, <laughs> obviously the UK is the place to be. <laughs> <laughs> or I mean, of course, you see it differently since uh, you've been living mm-hmm. there than someone who's been there just for a few times. Of course, yes, you know, it, there's always um, a different side to the coin, isn't there? So uh, from Brighton, why did you move to London? Was it because of work or career? Yeah, so I've always wanted to move to London just since I was, you know, I think like 16, 18. I'm kind of it's the place to be like the fact that london london is the uk it feels Mm -hmm. you know like this is where everything happens business um yeah absolutely everything so it was a no-brainer for me i moved to london because i launched a few a few tech startup oh which (laughs) yeah it was um it was quite an experience so myself and my business partner we were we launched the business when we were back home in kent and sussex um just living with parents Mm -hmm. and then ultimately we had to move to London just to like you know get new clients on board it was just for business opportunities and we moved to London and we found that it was extremely expensive (laughs) uh, (laughs) surprise yeah yeah, what a surprise here um and so the issue was that we had so many overheads with um with the business Mm -hmm. and also our personal um you know maintenance costs yeah and it, it kind of like like we're doing freelancing on the side for a few um clients here and there but it was it wasn't enough to you know keep um food like food on the plate so mm-hmm. we had to basically close down the business unfortunately oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Short, shortly after moving to london it was like six months in mm-hmm. so i mean that's kind of the long answer why i moved to london is because yeah more opportunities and it was better for our business yeah. at the time just for um business development yeah, completely understand. And what did you actually study? Were you always interested in business, marketing? I would say AI, but I guess back then there wasn't as much AI. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I actually wrote my thesis at university on the impact of AI in on customer loyalty in the, re, in the retail industry. And this was in <laughs> 2020, so it was pre-ChatGPT and all of that AI wave. So I was very much attuned and interested in AI way before, well, not way before, a year before Mm -hmm. all that um, ChatGPT came out. But then at university, yes, I've always been interested in business, specifically marketing. I'm quite a creative individual, let's say. So within Mm -hmm. business, you know, I don't like the boring accounting, finance, blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm, I'm here for the visuals and yeah, like that's why I studied university, marketing um, and management. And you know, since you know, church GPT and all of that has come out, I've you know I've, I've blended mm-hmm. the two. It's so like a perfect mix. Yes. No. Honestly, I love it. Mm-hmm. And did you actually study in Brighton or in London? Although I'm not Good sure if there are universities in Brighton. There are. Yeah. There's there's two actually. Um, and. I went to uh, the University of Sussex. So yeah, I'm, fr- I'm from Brighton, but I also went to university um, just down the road. But I didn't live with my parents. I did have some um, university experience, let's say. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, So how, how was actually the uh, thesis that you did on the AI in the end? In the end, yeah. I mean, it was good. You know, I got a good mark on it. <laughs> that's, um, that's the main thing. But also, yeah, it was really interesting just to like, you know, when I'm doing my... 
uh, literature review. It was very interesting to, you know, find out about AI from the, going back to the 1950s when the term was first coined and like the whole history of AI that was, you know, very interesting to start with and then actually conducting the research itself. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, I, I believe that the final verdict that, you know, I, I discovered was that AI had a greater impact on customer loyalty in low involvement retail mm -hmm. environments. So that's like supermarkets um you know like clothing retailers rather than yeah God, i'm really i'm really testing myself here <laughs> my memory but <laughs> no. also like ultimately that's what i found i found yeah ai had a greater impact in low involvement retail mm -hmm. retailers and what is it actually that made you interested in ai that early because for example i can understand that now it's booming so everyone kind of wants to stay up the head you know with what is going on but back then Uh, was it maybe interesting, I don't know, robots or artificial intelligence or what was it? God, I'm actually not sure, you know, like, I don't know what the calling was. It's just magic, you know, mm. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was something. And also, yeah, this is the reason. It's because, you know, like my whole, not my whole life, but the past like five, ten years, I've been kind of ruining or jealous of the fact that like, people who came maybe five, ten years before me, how they could capitalize on that kind of web 2.0 wave mm -hmm. of paid ads and like social media all just coming into existence. And it yes. was very easy for them. And that's how I feel about this new wave of AI. I'm like, hey, hang on a minute. Like this is very early stages. So, hey, let me jump on that bandwagon and capitalize mm -hmm. here. So maybe it's for, un <laughs> maybe it's for selfish reasons. <laughs> Um, it just makes so much sense to me, you know, like yeah. if something's trending, jump on it. No, I would say from my perspective, it like what you just mentioned, I feel like that mm. I'm rather in a position, what you said, and you are the person who is ahead. Because as you said, that you've been into it before this boom, it means that, you know, you've got a more background, better knowledge, you know, much more. Whereas uh, these days you can see AI everywhere, but it's because it's booming, because it's everywhere and it's kind of... It, Uh, unavoidable uh, mm. so i was just about to say that uh, it seems to me like that you've got the wrong perception <laughs> i would say that you underestimate yourself oh really yeah i actually do i feel that <laughs> like and people always tell me that too um and i'm only slowly realizing um yeah, yeah. It, it's like a fomo uh, you know fear of missing out that, that it's everywhere but but it seems like that uh, you are ahead because you've been into it much earlier than i'm pretty sure that a lot of people right now Yeah, no, definitely. And also, you know, like, I, you know, I was employed for the past, like, year or two. Um, and I haven't, like, I wasn't posting to LinkedIn, et cetera, from 2021. I, I, I only started posting to LinkedIn this year. Uh -huh. And had, yeah. I, had I started maybe a year or yeah, yeah, yeah. A, bit, a bit earlier, you know, I would be, like, phew, like <laughs> way yeah. ahead, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then after your uni university, is it when you uh, started the startup with your uh, partner? Or what were your steps after the uni? Yeah, so literally, like, we were writing our theses and then we were, like, writing the business plan on the side. Oh. And, uh, yeah, probably for our own um, detriment for our final marks, but it was all good. Um, yeah, <laughs> we, 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 we had this idea. We saw virtual brands were coming out of, like, we saw Mr. Beast, um, big YouTube influencer, was, was doing it. We were seeing many, many new entrants into the market and we're like, hey, there's an opportunity here within food tech and both our um well my partner's experience he's very hospitality uh, he's got a hospitality background whereas like i'm the marketer here so like blending our two respective expertise um mm -hmm. we decided to launch kitchen x watch which was our, our food tech startup which we essentially were operating a franchise model whereby we created these virtual brands which were for delivery only so you can't actually dine in and eat them you can only get them on delivery just eat and uber eats mm -hmm. and um, we created these brands we created all the ip the packaging the the menus the ingredients that skus etc and yeah and then we licensed uh, these brands to kitchen operators across the uk you know hoteliers takeaway uh, restaurant owners and All we took was a, a small commission of their sales. So it, it, it was a really smart idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. But then there was many, many lessons learned by um, en entering the market without, you know, um, viable proof 
that <laughs> this is going to be a profitable business because we found as we scaled, we we got to like 30 odd partners, which was you know, really impressive. Mm -hmm. The fact that um, we got to that size, but ultimately we were making <laughs> nothing, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. honestly, like taking into the business costs and also our maintenance costs. It was just, it was, wasn't worth our time on top of the customer service and because we had partners messaging us like all hours of the day and it was like oh yeah absolute, okay absolute right. nightmare but so, still, yeah, we called it quits so it's, on that. you know brave and impressive straight after you need to start your own startup no for sure like i'm so glad i did it that way around because you know um many people you know with a marketing that you'd get maybe a marketing assistant role marketing executive role but i, but I kind of like bypassed those stages of my um, career and just so when I went into full-time employment I instantly went into a marketing manager position rather than mm -hmm. kind of going through that junior um, yeah. yeah and is that something that you've been planning while finishing uni that you will start a startup with your partner that it will be your career yeah and honestly like we thought that this was going to make us um, Millionaires. Like, this was going to be f for the rest of our lives basically <laughs> okay yeah because just wondering that that is something that people, uh, or at least from my university experience, that people don't really have plans or don't know what they are going to do once they finish, you know, because it's usually once I finish, then I will start thinking about it, start sending applications. So just curious if it was kind of spontaneous or if you've been planning it. Yeah, for sure. So I actually have to give credit to my partner. He was the one that came up with the idea. And, um, you know, he was thinking about it for a long time before. If it was down to me, I probably would have just been like, let me just focus on my studies and then literally what you just said, do it afterwards. But mm -hmm. I think just like you know, testing the waters and just, you know, slowly, slowly each day, just doing like maybe five minutes, 10 minutes on it, yeah. iterating. Like that's essentially what we were doing mm -hmm. in the background. Um, yeah. And what are some lessons that you learned from this uh, startup experience? Mm, yeah, like I said earlier, it's like make sure you've got a viable um, market offering before going <laughs> to market. <laughs> do um, do the market research and yeah, really understand like what the processes are going to look like and how much time that's going to take. And um, also, when hiring people, make sure because we made a few hires and they actually took more time away from us than they actually kind of contributed to the business. So those first hires have to be time savers rather than time drainers, let's say. Mm. They have to, because, you know, like in hindsight, I sh we should have got some very, I mean, we don't have the budget, but we should have got more senior uh, people on board because then they would have just helped us go faster. Yes. Whereas we thought we could get more juniors um, and it was just, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson to learn the hard way. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. definitely. So after this experience, what were your next steps? Because I would maybe expect to try another startup or another venture. So was it like that? Or did you actually look for a traditional career or what, what they were about to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, I was freelancing on the side whilst running the, the business. It was okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it wasn't really, um, you know, giving, it wasn't providing the revenue that I needed to live in London. It's, yeah, you know, as I mentioned, it's so expensive. Yeah. So we're kind of forced to close down the business. It felt like the right time. It'd been two years of running it and we hadn't really broken to a level of revenue um, or scalability that we wanted. So close it down and we had to find alternative work, which was, um, you know, like I didn't really have a choice and that was okay. Um, I would have loved to start a new business, but <laughs> you know like, it's not I just, just like have to, yeah, of course yeah Oops. of course like what would it have been you know like uh, exactly so i found work and I, it's funny because um i then got a job for um a group of restaurants here in london and i i got a job and then they needed someone else so i i also got my business partner hired <laughs> as well so we were working for this company for um virtually a year together post us closing down the business so it was quite a unique situation the fact that you know like we co-founded this business together and then we went into full-time em employment together <laughs> but um and that was a b2c role so i'd i'd, I'd, go, I'd move from b to b and then into b2c within restaurant marketing which was 
quite an experience. Honestly, I don't like B2C. I'm, I'm a B2B guy through mm-hmm. and through um, now. I, I can say that. But it was a good experience for me to like see B2C in its fullest and be like, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's good but, to find out, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like you have to do everything once, so then you don't know. So then you know what you don't want, like. Um, and it, but I mean, it was great. I, like honestly, I think that's partly helped me with you know the social media marketing, just like doing all those Instagram reels. And it was actually just me and um, my business partner who were the marketing team there. So it was very much a startup mentality still, even when we we're employed. Yeah, and and I guess. Uh good situation when you knew each other how you two guys work and then working together again so you already have a relationship so i guess it helped yeah it, yeah it helps and also you know like when you've got when you're no longer your own bosses anymore then it can also like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know mm-hmm. not help <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah so uh, working there was it something that you didn't enjoy so you uh, wanted to try something else or why did you you know leave from there then yeah it just wasn't really a fit to be honest i think the expectations around um like the boss essentially thought that we could double company revenue uh in the given the the economic circumstances we're going through with the um especially hospitality you know like the wages are increasing uh ingredient costs are going up you know it just wasn't uh a, a, it was a nonsensical business target oh, yeah. so you know this guy thought they was going to bring us on board and we we're going to double the company revenue it's like come on like let's be let's set smart goals here mm-hmm. and you know we definitely contributed to revenue growth but it wasn't the two um it wasn't the doubling like it was expected so i think you know it just it it, it kind of ended a bit sourly but um mm. it was okay because that you know i then moved on to my current role which i'm back in b2b and you know, i'm much happier than i was there yeah and looking back do you think that it was actually nonsense uh, his his goal to double it or was it because maybe you could do something differently or do more work yeah i mean i think obviously like you know when you hire two young founders um, and bring them into your business you you think they're going to be like rocket fuel uh, to <laughs> like full of energy um, need to need to squeeze them out properly yeah 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 exactly it was it was it was it was nuts like um i even remember being told that we can manage our own hours how we like which was you know great it's like wow we've just come up come from a self-employed background so hmm. that's perfect for me but then you know you risk also the expectation to work longer than your yeah hours you know like it was just like uh, red mm. flags <laughs> uh, it, it looks too too good to be true Yes, it was very much so. Agreed. Mm-hmm. So af- after that, was it something uh, that based on this experience you wanted to uh, work for yourself again? Or why did you decide for the your current journey after that experience? Sure. So yeah, I, I, I wanted to get back into B2B. So I decided to you know, get back on the job market and I found my current role at Vamoose, which is um, uh, a travel app and we provide uh, software to travel companies. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. This is yeah, the job you do now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, cool. this is the current role I'm in. It's you know, a SaaS company, which is great. Um, and B2B, you know, those were two big ticks for me. And I've been doing that since August of last year. Mm-hmm. So coming up to a year now. And can you share how did you find uh, find a job? LinkedIn, of course. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, it, it makes sense, yeah. So when you found it on LinkedIn, did you already have a LinkedIn present there? Or did you... You know, just go there as as one of the ways, basically, how to look for the job, or uh, you know, why LinkedIn? Uh, so yeah, pre- so I found the previous job I, I was talking about through Indeed, and after that, I was like, I'm never going back to Indeed. That is just not <laughs> the job platform for me, to be honest. Mm. <laughs> I, I'm not and a big fan of it either. No, it's yeah. I mean, I think it's great if you're maybe looking for part time work, but if you really want like professional. Uh, yeah like work then don't bother <laughs> um yeah and, but, and yeah. just as a side note i feel like when you look at indeed nothing against indeed but just maybe my opinion <laughs> but it feels like the 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 profile doesn't really tell you much about the company whereas if you see it on linkedin you can literally you know click click it and check the company in there and which gives you a better idea or better impression of the company or what is it like Maybe it was just my impression, but that's what I felt like. 
I 100% agree. Yeah, of course, you actually have a company profile that you can see on LinkedIn as well as the company website. It's like double uh, social proof there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Definitely. So, um, yeah, that after that experience, I decided to um, look for work on LinkedIn instead. And yeah, like you're saying, I, I, I found it way better for it. And yeah, I didn't really have a presence on LinkedIn at that time. Um, I just was a regular lurker, like the majority of people. Did you see it only as a kind of online CV? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I did a, a post or two here, like, you know, like, I did a post around a half marathon I ran or a new job I got. Also the one about me quitting um, my previous job. So like I'd done a few posts, but it was like, yeah. negligible. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the point when you uh, kind of decided or found out that LinkedIn, that there is a potential that you're going to focus on this platform? Hmm. Yeah, good question. I mean, I'm not sure when I realized it exactly, but when I got, when I started working at my new role, you know, we're B2B. So, you know, I'm way more active on LinkedIn than I was for the previous role because that was B2C. So I was more on Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> and then yeah. when I went back to B2B, I was back on LinkedIn. I was like, oh, hang on a minute. There's a lot of people talking about AI on here. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And so that was like in the, like in the back of my mind, just kind of getting the cogs whirring or turning, let's say. And... It was interesting because obviously I was seeing so many AI tools on LinkedIn, which I was super interested by because, you know, I, I, I do have a, an interest in AI mm -hmm. and I was bringing them to my manager. I was like, hey, look at this new AI tool. <laughs> um, <laughs> and by the end of it, um, I think she just lost interest in the amount I was sharing because, you know, like she's got her day job to focus on and yeah. can't have the brain space to think about this AI tool and that. So the fact that I, I was kind of overwhelming her with AI tools, I then had the idea to start my own mm. um, newsletter on LinkedIn. Yeah. Actually on LinkedIn itself rather than you know, on Beehive or Substack. Yeah, yeah. And it started out of pure passion back in October of last year. So it was a few months after, after starting my new job. Mm -hmm. And it was just, yeah, it was called MarTech Weekly. And it was just a roundup of all the latest marketing news that had come out that week. And it was just, yeah, purely passion project. I, I'd get like one, two likes on my early posts. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and just, uh, I'm curious briefly with your current job, is it also mm. taking care of the social media and the marketing in general? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I'm, I do look after the marketing. It's more email marketing uh, and social media yeah so focused on linkedin um as a key platform but it's interesting because we were leveraging linkedin uh, on our company page very early on in my time and then we've slowly but surely also moved to the social selling creator approach as of this year so um yeah yeah i mean i do do something else oh yeah i do do quite a lot of graphic design as well at mm -hmm. work. okay and you said it's uh, some travel app mm -hmm. Yeah, for B2B. So we provide the tech to tour operators, travel agents uh, globally. So we're not B2C. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. I was just curious. Sound, sounds cool. Mm. And coming back to your newsletter, uh, weren't you mm -hmm. thinking actually about running a newsletter on one of the platforms, such as, as you said, Beehive, ConvertKit or something like that? Mm. Yeah, 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 totally. I guess um, it was just a lower bar barrier to entry with LinkedIn. Um, I actually don't know why I started on LinkedIn. I guess because obviously you have traffic mm -hmm. who are like your network who are going to see your newsletter versus if you start on ConvertKit or yeah. Hive or something, then you've got to work really hard to get that traffic to mm -hmm. subscribe. If you want to boost your online presence, check out our digital marketing agency called Trailblazed. You can also enroll in our Skillshare course called the 10 tips on how to succeed in your creative career which was inspired by the podcast. Lastly, make sure to subscribe to our weekly newsletter called Creative Spotlight to stay up to date with the show and more. Links are in the show notes. Thanks. And you said before that you were getting just a few likes. So what's the situation like now? There is several hundreds. <laughs> oh yeah, hundreds. Yeah, easy. Oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So... Um, 
Can you introduce sure. Newsletter a bit more? Like uh, when you send it, you said it's about uh, a kind of roundup of AI, but uh, maybe the process, how you write it? Yeah, sure. So it's actually around you know, marketing and AI. That's why I started off as Mark Tech Weekly, marketing technology <laughs> on a weekly basis. And essentially what it is, so, I mean, it started off as just a general kind of, I'm not even sure. It just didn't have a format. It was just me dumping all the latest stories on there to get like one, two likes as expected. But, you know, I kept going. I kept persevering. I kept, because it was, it was purely our passion. I, I wasn't thinking about the business opportunities mm -hmm. or the potential personal brand growth that might be associated with it later down the line. But... Yeah, I was just, it was just purely, purely passion. And week in, week out, I got better. You know, my covers improved, the structure got better. And now I'm at a point when I've got, um, or even very early on, I've got a very clear structure. Um, it's got a title, the, UR, the URL, the publisher, an overview, very succinct overview, like one, two sentences, mm -hmm. three key points, just very, you know, that's it, three in three key points in a sentence or two, and then a marketer's POV, which is kind of the, the USP of my newsletter versus um, the sea of other newsletters out there, mm -hmm. is that it, it, it offers a unique marketer's perspective on their latest AI developments. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what's the length? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it's not too long, to be honest. It's usually like, a, it, it always says on LinkedIn around five minute read now. So, mm -hmm. and I probably cover around like five to 10 stories weekly maximum yes so uh, I, that's something i've been always wondering about but there are lots of news uh, how how do you mm. pick what's worth sharing is it what's the most interesting to you or what do you feel like the audience would enjoy the most yeah for sure i mean yeah i mean that the fact you mentioned that is a is it's just come to mind that part of the reason why i started the newsletter as well is because there's so much marketing ai news to stay on top of it was purely as well so that i could stay on top of it <laughs> by, <laughs> yeah by, kind of forces you yeah yeah exactly exactly i have to be on top of the latest news otherwise um the newsletter doesn't get published and so a, a lot of it comes from linkedin to be honest i'm just on linkedin every day every <laughs> hour uh always scrolling and i just see what's happening with the latest whether it's um whether it's you know chat gpt or google or you know more niche players out there uh, smaller mm -hmm. players um but then obviously there is a bit of google searching maybe i've only got three articles to cover for a week then i'm gonna have to do some additional source finding using the likes of perplexity or just regular old google mm -hmm. yeah what are some uh curators or even newsletters that you subscribe to or that you follow for uh, you know insight from whether it comes to the world of ai or world of marketing yeah yeah good question so ai tool report is a good one uh tldr morning brew uh i say mindstream too um and i will need to do research after this i i don't know a lot of well i mean that's how it kind of started with these newsletters like that's very good point as well is that i'm subscribed to them all and i'd just be at work or just you know receiving them i'm like oh like that's a good one to include in my newsletter so like not let's stealing. get inspired yes <laughs> inspiration <laughs> and are there any specific creators or people from the scene oh god all right well i mean i could be here all day um <laughs> but i definitely say uh audrey chaya she was uh one of the very early creators who inspired me as well as the likes of, like luke matthews a bigger creator and well, there's so many like i could go all day but and like andrew bollis mm -hmm. um my friend um noam and ruben hasid as well like those yeah those guys too i yeah, can honestly. imagine it will be a long list <laughs> yeah 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 honestly i can name anna york anna york that is one that i must mention she A ai seo queen mm -hmm. the one to follow for sure yeah and this was about the newsletter, but when it comes to your own uh, content strategy, you as a creator on LinkedIn, can you tell us more about, you know, about your post, your strategy, and basically how you run your own personal profile? Yeah, good question. And this is exactly what I do, you know, AI powered content strategy. So how I run my profile has 
it's been a, a big old iteration you know <laughs> when i started back in october i was like a regular person using linkedin i wasn't this like creator who's with the huge working. following <laughs> well yeah i mean <laughs> i'm only at 12k for now but let's see what next year holds uh, yeah so i started off using the regular linkedin um scheduling solution it's, you know i was posting to linkedin maybe like once maybe twice a week from october to january very regularly i was just resharing like ai news about like picker or runway being like oh this looks cool and yeah i was getting zero traction nothing at all really and then over the christmas period um whilst everyone was you know singing merry christmas <laughs> on- over eating <laughs> yeah i mean i was doing that too but i mean <laughs> yeah. also whilst doing that i was like i i, I remember well like on Christmas Day, I was there, you know, strategizing, planning my LinkedIn for the new year. Mm-hmm. And that was a key turning point for me is that Christmas period. I took a week or so to think about like my profile banner, think about my headline, think about the content strategy that yep. I, was, I was posting. And it was, it was actually like a thought out strategy. I, I defined my content matrix, you know, my posting schedule, all of that. Uh, whereas before it was just, I was, it was it, just no thought into it. It was just random and um, sporadic. Mm-hmm. So that was the big turning point for me. Is I I, I started using a content schedule on Notion. So I I'd, 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 I'd save all my not save the actual post, but just have a placeholder so I know what I'm posting on what day. Yeah. So because, because with the the native LinkedIn scheduling solution, it's so bad you don't know like, <laughs> like you don't really have an overview of the calendar i don't so feel like ed- it either you know? and it's I like if recommend. you schedule something you cannot edit it unless unless it's posted already it doesn't make sense yeah exactly i hate it um <laughs> and yeah because like if you want to re-upload the document it's such a headache mm-hmm. so i then moved over to notion and authored up and that was my like scheduling solution if authored up i'd um well, I mean, I wouldn't recommend them anymore, but I used to highly recommend them because you can just save the drafts. Yeah. And then you can edit them quite um, easily. Mm-hmm. So I found that really helped me with my LinkedIn scheduling process. Also, a key thing for me, which I realized over the Christmas period, was um, engaging with others was something that I was missing from October to Christmas, basically. I was just posting and running. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And the the key difference for me for me was when I started to because I, I just started speaking with people from all over the world on LinkedIn like over the Christmas period. I was like, yes, how do you do it? Like, what am I missing here? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, you need to engage with people. Like, you need to you know, have more storytelling in your about section. So, like, yeah, I I simply just asked, and mm. people told me and showed me and showed me the way, which was like, yeah, that's me before. Um, it, yeah, you know, the exponential growth. And it sounds like a perfect time and since you had this kind of change or update during Christmas, then mm. you started big in the new year. So it's, uh, you know, entering the store strong into the new year. Yeah, yeah, exactly that. Like it was my mission. I was like, I'm going to post LinkedIn. And I remember my targets were so, um, like I smashed my targets. I remember I set for Q1, <laughs> which was another thing which I didn't have previously i didn't set myself any targets or goals so what was i striving for mm. and i'm and i remember i i said i think i started i had like two thousand followers so i had a good base to start with and i said to myself i'm gonna hit three thousand followers by the end of q1 mm-hmm. and i think i smashed it by like one thousand two thousand followers <laughs> i was on like 4k 5k by the end of q1 yeah nice yeah and actually how frequently do you post per week Mm, it was like three times a week back then and just slowly 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 it's crept up crept up <laughs> um so what is it like so you... now oh yeah it's every day then can you tell a bit more about the process how actually you create content because yeah. of course it it's not that easy to create quality content that you can yeah. share so frequently yeah 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 for sure i mean so i think i have a bit of an advantage with the fact that um i know adobe um, and I learned that on my um, placement year at university. I, I was a marketing and design assistant for, for a whole year, mm. just on Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, uh, InDesign, just you know, designing, designing. So when Canva became popular and a thing, I was like, this is 
this is so easy what the hell <laughs> you know um and that has definitely helped me um when it comes to content creation because all i use is canva i don't really bother with adobe anymore oh yeah. i was actually about to ask you about canva i was expecting that you would be adobe person hating canva but so i'm surprised that uh, <laughs> yeah like this yeah no i mean i'm all all for making um yeah our our workflows and life easier so i don't know why people apart from maybe their advanced features like if you're really technical then i'm because i'm just making like nice cheat sheets and carousels that's it i'm not doing like any advanced stuff really yeah, yeah, yeah. and that's half the battle is the graphic design i think like if you have that in your toolkit then you'll fly easily obviously then yeah i've been leveraging ChatGPT from the start and going back to the newsletter maybe like i had a custom gpt for my weekly newsletter on linkedin which i was using every week um once i got past that kind of the, the manual process of writing it and i had a clear structure and i was like hey let me build a custom gpt they've just come out it probably makes sense that i use them mm -hmm. and that was fine like it worked for a few weeks but then gpt's degrade over time and i didn't update it and by the end of it it, it became more hassle for me to use it than like to write the newsletter yes it would like it was taking me more time to write with the gpt than not so i was like hang on a minute there's a problem i need to <laughs> i need to solve this mm -hmm. and what happened was that i then developed well perplexity also became more relevant and prominent in in the industry i was like hey this looks like a pretty cool bit of kit to write newsletters with potentially so i took all my learnings from the previous editions of my newsletter and all the instructions are put into the custom GPT and develop this mega prompt, which I just put into perplexity and it writes the entire newsletter cool. for me very fast. And it, honestly, it saved 80% 80, 80 of my writing time. So would you recommend, I, I, I tried perplexity mm. a bit, but I'm still, uh, I still use chat GPT, but would you then recommend maybe trying perplexity in case it may be better than chat GPT? Oh yeah. Oh god, really? yeah, 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 definitely. Like, I think there's, I mean, it's obviously there's unique benefits to both, but I mean, I find myself using perplexity more and more. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, because you can also generate images with Dali, Playground, and Stable Diffusion in perplexity too. So most people think it's just limited to being like an AI search engine, but you can do generate much images. Yeah, you can do so much, and the copy is actually um, one is going to be factually the most accurate because it's an AI search engine. Yeah, it actually versus like ChatGPT searching through Bing search, which I just don't trust. <laughs> I mean, Bing Bing's fine, but it's yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and what about uh, trying uh, Gemini or Claude or yeah, so some I'm, other tools? Yeah, I've been a big fan of Gemini since it came out. A really big fan, but in the past few weeks, I've fallen out with it and i actually cancelled my gemini subscription <laughs> a day or two ago <laughs> um and I'm, I'm back on gpt 4.0 surprisingly yeah. um because it is really good but i find gemini is better at writing human sounding copy it's just got a certain quirkiness to it which chat gpt can't mm -hmm. match it always says like fascinating let's delve into this <laughs> yeah. those disgusting chat gpt words that <laughs> I, I i dislike so much whereas gemini it's good for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's good to hear. It makes me also uh, kind of rethink how I use it and explore other tools. And speaking of tools, are there some other you know um, tools or software or something that helps you to make your life easier and basically be more productive? Yeah, definitely. So Veed's uh, a big one for me of late. It's it's really great for editing videos fast. There's tons of other, like, other tools out there like Descript or InVideo that you could use. Mm -hmm. But I prefer Veed's. I mean... Is it Veed's IO, isn't it? Yeah, Veed.io. It's all capitalized, the yeah. letters. And it's got some great AI features that cleans the audio. It removes ums and ahs. And I find that I literally just record a video. It'll take like five minutes, 10 minutes to record the video, put it into Veed, and then it will cut it all for me. It mm. might not be perfect, but then I can just go over it and just like fine tune it. And it probably only takes like 20 minutes, 30 minutes to mm -hmm. make a video now. Yep. And any other tools? Um, yeah, there are more. Are there uh, some, some secret ones that you don't want to reveal? The secret ones. <laughs> ah. <laughs> 
So I've got Gemini, then I've got Perplexity. Those are the ones that I'm using day in, day out. But sorry, one other tool that's just come to mind is Supergrow, which I've been using a lot recently. Mm -hmm. It's it's basically an all-in-one LinkedIn growth tool, which can do scheduling, engagements, and also you, you can create carousels and write copy in there too. So it literally does everything in one. And so I mentioned Notion and Notion and authored up earlier. I used to use those as kind of two separate tools for one, having an overview of the schedule and then saving drafts. Yep. But now I just use Supergrow for absolutely everything. It's been a game changer for me. Mm -hmm. That sounds great. I will need to check it out. And speaking of social media, are you present on other channels than just LinkedIn? Just LinkedIn for now. Uh, I honestly, like on top of my full-time job, I don't even have the time to really manage LinkedIn. So um, the other ones are coming very soon. I mean, I say very soon, probably not until like next year, but yeah. <laughs> and what what are the, then the channels that you plan to use? Yeah, so it's definitely going to be... Oh, Twitter, I guess, I mean, right? Yeah, X does come to mind, but then I'm also thinking YouTube and TikTok, obviously video being um, a growing force. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that was actually my next question, how you manage to uh, take care of everything. It sounds like you've got a lot on your plate, but still productive, still do, doing well. How do you do that? Thank you. Honestly, it's um, lack of sleep and just pure <laughs> de like determination, I think. <laughs> um, because, yeah, I wake up like, five six a.m i'll then you know schedule my posts i might like work on some content in the morning and then i do some like a lot of engagement work on the platform uh, in my feed and then you know i'm straight to work and then you know like in, at lunch i'm doing some more work and it's oh, it's it's honestly like i'm i'm, I'm getting increasingly stretched mm. um as i grow but uh, I actually don't know how I'm managing. Luckily, um, my partner supports me. They're quite helpful with um, you know, cooking, cleaning, <laughs> things like that. So then I don't have to worry as as much about it. So that also helps having a supportive um, you know, mm -hmm. person and it, behind you. And it sounds you still enjoy it, right? Which is definitely something that helps. Yeah, of course. Like it's this is all out of passion. Honestly, I just love creating content and the fact that I can blend it with AI to make content. Well, first content about ai and also use ai to help me make my content faster it's just like until it stops becoming a passion for me then i'll stop like you, you won't see me post anymore mm -hmm. yeah so uh what are actually your plans uh, for the future of course planning to grow and probably learning and improving but have you got any specific goals mm, good question well, i mean i've always wanted to, to run my own marketing agency that is kind of the goal and to be a digital nomad so mm. trying to merge the two there hopefully you know in a few years time i'll be running my, my own marketing agency in bali on um, a sun lounger <laughs> just soaking up the sun i was about to ask you where would you as a digital nomad where would you uh, like to be and uh, in indonesia came to my mind so is it actually the one I mean, Bali's the textbook answer. Um, if I actually think about it, then I'm not sure. I mean, there's tons of emerging um, Asian economies, which really appeal to me, but also, you know, the likes of France also too. Um, mm. Je parle français un petit peu. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's definitely appealing. I mean, Europe isn't off the cards, but also South America. Like, um, I hear so much about those um, those countries there. They sound like a, a vibe, so. Who knows, to be honest, Thomas, I, I actually don't know. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, what do you do actually in, in your free time? What to help? I mean, if you have free time, is there, do you have uh, <laughs> hobbies outside of this that help you kind of, I don't know, balance, balance your life or stay sane? Good question. So, I mean, I used to run and uh, gym way more. <laughs> oh, you, you mentioned half marathon before, right? Yes, and I was actually signed up to do the Brighton Marathon this year, but my um my knees weren't playing so nice. So oh, okay. yeah, I do like to run and go to the gym. But since like in the past few months, I've just stopped, which is probably the <laughs> um, the dark side of LinkedIn growth. It's like, hey, people, make sure to prioritize your health too, mm -hmm. because that's something I'm not doing. And I think I feel like it's kind of like a short term sacrifice for a long term gain, mm -hmm. uh, because you know, you know, the, the day that I go 100 percent freelance and into LinkedIn, then I know that I can prioritize my health again. Yeah. But for now, it's like on top of the full-time job and the LinkedIn growth, there's it, not enough hours in yeah, a day. So yeah. 
besides that, you know, I, I'm I'm always on Duolingo too, like when I'm not working. Oh, nice. I'm I don't know. I'm I'm just learning French on there. So um, that's cool. and also trying to see a bit of London. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, pay so much to be here. You may as well try and maximize the sites. Mm -hmm. And out of curiosity, why why are you learning French? Oh, so my partner, he's French. Oh wow! Okay. That's cool. Well, I mean, like first generation British, but then all, with French heritage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we 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 just want to move to uh, France <laughs> one oh, day, I think. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, and also like, so French was the only GCSE I failed. Funny enough. Oh, failed. I got. Yeah, I failed it. <laughs> like I got a bit, a big old D in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's funny because I remember how much of a headache French was for me in in um at school. I. I detested the language <laughs> and then it's funny to my partner i've like started learning it and i've been learning it for like five years so. mm. and i still can't really speak it so <laughs> no you, you you said some great phrases before it, it sounded you know professional and i think no. it, it's it's a perfect timing because now there is going to be olympics so maybe it it's it's like motivation to learn it or it actually gives you some okay this is the reason why i learned it now i will understand maybe better or something yeah for sure i mean it would be nice just to like i mean and i do find it helpful like even when i connect with creators on linkedin who are like maybe french or they're like bonjour like, in the DMs. <laughs> <laughs> like, and i just it's just a useful like um icebreaker as well um to have but the issue being french people just love to one they're very good at speaking english and two they think that we don't really speak the language very well so <laughs> whenever I try to speak French, they'll just be like, no, no, it's fine. Let's speak English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and um, with uh, your interest in AI, I would be curious, are there any, maybe your favorite films or TV series or books? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. And, Whether um, something that you enjoy or something that maybe influenced you? I actually like. I'm not really um, oh, you don't a film oh. guy. Like a, a guy, yeah. I don't watch many films, <laughs> to be honest. And what like, about I'm, books? Not even reading. Yeah, I, I yeah I do read, but they're more like uh, self help books. Like at the minute, I'm yeah. It's it's actually all self help. I don't really read about. Oh, okay, so. okay. Then I'm always on like continuous improvement. Then share some favorite self help books. Okay, okay. So I like the Lean Startup, which I read du during the time um, when mm -hmm. I was launching my my business. Yeah. I also liked. Um, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. My memory is so bad. It was something about um, negotiations. That is just not very helpful, is it? But it's I'm, from I'm reading Chris. One... Chris was, I guess, split the difference. Yes, something like that. Yes, you literally yeah. read my mind. No, nice. it's it's quite well known book. Yeah. Yeah, I love that book. That was probably one of my favorite books in um, in recent years. And I've also been reading a lot more about like organizational behavior uh, recently because my boss, she she's great with book re recommendations. So recently we read one called like, The Culture Code and uh, mm -hmm. Essentialism, Radical Canada I'm reading at the minute. Like these are kind of what I'm focusing on at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but cool. no, like no AI films or books. Sadly, like <laughs> I was, I was expecting maybe something like I don't know, I am a robot or. Uh, oh yeah, obviously that that film was cool. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I am Legend stands out to me. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, yeah. Although so it's, that was it's, really legendary. It's not with robots, is it? It's with zombies. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but still a good one, yeah. And then to kind of slowly uh, wrap it up. Can you share some uh, final tips and tricks uh, on how to start and stand out on LinkedIn? Yeah, 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 yeah. God, so um, prepare yourself. It's it's not easy. Don't think that just posting is gonna make you, you know, grow fast on LinkedIn. There's a whole ball game to it. Like there's the engagements. Like I mentioned, like if you're posting and not engaging with other people, then your posts will not get the attention they deserve to you also you have to be you know like i could talk about the content creation side of things but you also need to really think about like your niche and exactly what you're addressing because like i'm marketing and ai but you know i i see people go like even then i feel too broad mm -hmm. with the marketing and ai i've since niched it down to content marketing but even then like i i still feel broad like with within content 
content marketing, there's SEO, there's graphic design. Like there's so much more that I could niche down further. Yeah, to yeah. the likes of like Anna York, who's AI SEO, like the more niche that you can go with it, the better the outcome would be. And I think that's a rule for life and business generally. Mm -hmm. This may be the question, if you were starting again, is there something that you would do differently than before? God, I've, I've honestly thought about starting again. I was like, I wouldn't go through it all <laughs> again. Like <laughs> just do thinking it. about everything I've yeah, just don't just don't do it guys um <laughs> what would I do different honestly I have no I have no regrets whatsoever I've no like I, nothing I changed like I just love the the place I'm in and where I'm heading and I can't yeah honestly I mean it's engage sounds good. earlier yeah, yeah yeah no I mean that's the only thing I say is just engage with others earlier um which which I was missing on from October to January like had I been showing the community more love then I think that I would yep. have found more traction sooner Mm -hmm. So then, uh, to finish it up, is there something that I haven't asked you and maybe you would like to share or some kind of question that, uh, you know, or, or message that you want to put out there? Uh, yeah, follow Charlie Hills on LinkedIn, first of all. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, I said it jokingly, but I mean, it's... Um... No, of course, you can yeah. promote yourself. Where can people follow you? Where can, where they can find you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, at the minute, I'm just on LinkedIn, um, as we mentioned, but also check out my newsletter um, on Substack. It's, um, there's a link on my profile. That, that's where I share all the juicy uh, mega prompts and behind the scenes there that you won't see on my LinkedIn feed. But yeah, besides that, I don't really have many promotionals at the minute. <laughs> it's, it's, that's it for sure. But um at least yeah. we don't get overwhelmed where to go. We know specifically where to go and we'll find you there. That's it. LinkedIn. Like that's where I'm living at the minute. That's my second home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool. I think then uh, we can slowly finish it up, Charlie. Uh, thank you so much for joining. It was a pleasure to meet you. I feel like I, I know you already, although only from LinkedIn. So it, it was a pleasure to finally meet, not live in person, but at least virtually. <laughs> No, thank you, Thomas. Honestly, it's been a pleasure being here, and thank you for the like the authentic, honest chat because it's it's not something you always um, see from these. So I really love the angle and what you're doing here on the podcast. So thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate it, and we'll keep following. And wish you good luck, of course. <laughs> Thanks, man. You too. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app, get in touch to provide your feedback, or share any ideas for future guests. Thank you, and see you soon.